Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to some of you are in other parts of the world. The unprecedented global social and economic crisis caused by COVID-19 pandemic has exposed our world's fragility and interdependence, affecting nearly every country, community, and family all across the globe. At the height of the pandemic, UNESCO said that over 1.6 billion students were unable to continue their learning. Even the practical training for skills development, this was interrupted. Over 63 million teachers were asked to respond and to transform their teaching and learning process using flexible learning modalities, blended offline, online, home-based learning, hybrid learning. We're worried that COVID-19 pandemic will slow, stagnate, or even reverse our work on sustainable development over the years. We really wanted to promote quality and accessible education and lifelong learning programs for everyone. COVID-19 may be affecting and will be bringing us learning crisis that will push millions of children and young people out of the educational system. But we will never stop. We are here in this extraordinary session of the Global Education Meeting. This will serve as a platform for global leaders and high level policymakers to agree on a set of global education priorities to be put in place by the end of 2021 for the recovery and strengthening of education systems at the country level, focusing on our theme, which is reimagine teaching and learning. Allow me now to share with you the you know, experts we have invited in this particular meeting. So we will be working with our experts from the region and even beyond. Our session leaders, we have Peter, Alexander, and Cecilia from UNESCO. I am Ethel Valenzuela from CIMEO, Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Secretariat in Bangkok, Thailand. And we have our rapporteur, the director herself, Ms. Yumiko Yokozeki. I'm very, very pleased and honored to introduce to you our panelists. We have honorable speakers, ministers themselves. His Excellency, Mr. Jai Birai, Minister of Education of the Royal Government of Bhutan. He will be joined by Her Excellency, Ms. Victoria Angulo, Minister of Education of Colombia, and Honorable Claudette Irere, Minister of State in charge of ICT and Tibet of the Republic of Rwanda. We're also lucky to have with us honorable speakers who are representing various groups. Mr. Akwasi Adey Bohim is the policy advisor National Education Reform Secretariat of the Republic of Ghana. I'm also pleased to have with us Ms. Saldis Holst. She is a Deputy Secretary General of the Education International. And Dr. Jaime Saavedra Shandubi, Global Director of the World Bank. Dr. Karen Mandi is a professor at the University of Toronto, Canada. And Ms. Yara Ramadan, Youth Leader from Palestine. So we have with us those who are seasoned experts, ministers, thought leaders from all over the world. How do we now reimagine teaching and learning, especially during this time of pandemic? Let me start by introducing our first speaker who will give the opening presentation. He is Mr. Jai Birai, Minister of Education, Royal Government of Bhutan. Very good thought leader and very influential policymaker. He obtained his master's degree in business administration at the Netherlands, and also he served as CEO for a chief you know, AMG group of trainers from 2013 to 2017 finance officer at MOFA. I will not keep you long. I would like to call on the minister himself from the Royal Government of Bhutan, Mr. Jai B. Rai. The floor is yours, Your Excellency. Good 
Warm greetings from Botanla. Honorable panelists and officials of UNESCO, it is an honor for me to give the opening remarks for such an important virtual meeting. I would like to thank UNESCO for the opportunity. The year 2020 will be remembered in the history of mankind for the global shock it gave us all. None of the countries are spared by the COVID-19 pandemic. While it remains uncertain how the global health crisis will unfold, collective political commitment must be galvanized at the highest level to prioritize education in the recovery phase with a view to accelerating progress towards SDG 4 Education 2030 agenda in the decade of action to deliver sustainable development goals by 2030. It is against this backdrop UNESCO is convening the extraordinary session of the Global Education Meeting 2020 uh, to discuss the theme, reimagine teaching and learning to accelerate progress towards SDG 4 in the COVID-19 context and beyond. And draw a roadmap to improve the global SDG 4 Education 2030 coordination mechanism. Because of the pandemic, schools, colleges, universities were closed, hence disrupting the education. Teaching and learning could not take place in its normal sense. In Bhutan, we launched the Education in Emergency initiative whereby children in the country were provided with continuous educational activities through online and other media platforms. Besides being the medium and source of entertainment, television and radio channels became the medium of lesson delivery and learning as a record lessons, recorded lessons were broadcasted daily during dedicated time allotted to education. In an effort to make online and remote learning more affordable to all, provisions were made for special concessions on data charges for students and devices were provided to needy. Further, in our efforts to minimize inequalities in education to the population in the rural pockets where connectivity is either poor or non-existent, and the digital divide high because of socioeconomic status, the ministry developed self-instructional manual. Teachers went to distribute self-instructional manual and explain it to the children in the far-flung villages. The same lessons were also delivered through radio channels. Teachers volunteered to be mobile teachers and visit, visit, uh, visit children in remote households and help children both in their academics and psychosocial aspects of life. The ministry gave a professional development programs to teachers in Google Classroom so that they deliver online lessons to the children. Monitoring and assessment of children's works are also uh, carried out through Google Classroom. The pandemic has taught us that we are all interdependent, interconnected. Therefore, we must all come together to find solutions. Therefore, it is time that we reimagine teaching and learning. Teachers must equip to teach in any situation during COVID or beyond COVID. Further, students must be skilled to resilient in any situation and acquire skills and competency to face any kind of situation. I hope that, uh, that uh, forums such as these meetings must discuss way forward in teaching and learning. Today, even as I share my country's practices in teaching and learning during this pandemic, I'm here to learn more from you all. In my opinion, ICT has become an important tool in teaching and learning. How do we use ICT to make teaching and learning more effective? What kind of professional development program must be given to teachers 
so that they have the required knowledge and skills to teach in a new normal. What psycho, uh, psychologically and social, social uh, emotional uh, support must be rendered to teachers and students in such situations? How do we support ourselves in harnessing the potential of ICT? What are some of the best practices that we can share and learn from each other? How do we make our school curriculum relevant and current so that the children are competent to face any situation? I would like to request you all to ponder on these questions and share your opinions. Together we can achieve miracles. So I hope we have fruitful discussion and learn from each other. Thank you and Tastile. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for sharing with us what you have undertaken, what you have planned, and what you're currently doing in Bhutan for our learners and for our teachers. They're really very good examples. And there yet, there are some challenges on ICT and how to make it better and how to build back better together. So now I would like to call on our next presenter, who is actually minister herself, very popular. Her Excellency, Ms. Maria Victoria Angulo, is actually an economist. So we'll be perhaps listening more of these suggestions from an economist herself. Without much ado, I would like to call on Her Excellency, Ms. Maria Victoria Angulo, Minister of Education, Colombia. Thank you all for the invitation and the opportunity to share our experience regarding this important issue. Since before the pandemic, we have been tackling the challenge of equity, of achieving complete school trajectories for all. And together with teachers, the school heads and family, we were working towards a common goal, improve learning outcomes and advance towards stealing global citizenships in our school environments always recognizing that existing gaps in our system between rural and urban areas. So when the pandemic arrived, instead of trimming down these dimensions, they have become even more important. On the one hand, it has completed us to be aware of the importance of mental and emotional well-being of the whole education community. On the other hand, from the point of view of global citizenship, a pandemic of this proportion has made us think as values as solidarity, teamwork, and empathy to need to prepare students to have a critical understanding of crisis situation and to be resilient and participate in action that can help to transform the communities, our countries in more democratic, inclusive, peaceful, just, and sustainable societies. Regarding preschool, primary, and secondary education, we have developed online work called School Environments for Life and Citizenships. It's an example, it's a television program we create called Your Teacher at Home, which include activities to develop socio-emotional and citizenship competences. The projects like Emotion for Life and Step by Step also allows teachers to intentionally work with the students and development socio-emotional skills. Training teachers and school heads to develop these competences and be able to teach them is also very important. In Colombia, we have strengthened two programs through virtual environments and networking, all to learn and contact to teachers. And Contact for Teachers is a virtual platform that has four sections, connect, take care, transform, and inspire. In both cases, socio-emotional and citizenship skills are an integral part of the training process. We are also aware that citizenship education is also an, in a high percentage developed in the family context to the relationship between family and school. So the Strategy Alliance Family School has played a crucial role in this moment and has been consolidated but collaborative solidarity and mutual support action to promote learning of children during their education trajectories. In this regard, evaluation and promotion tools must work as a key drivers to close learning gaps. So the Ministry of Education has been implementing strategies to use evaluation to achieve curricular flexibility 
and prioritize learning outcomes. and prioritize the most important strategy has been evaluating to move forward jointly with the National Institute of Evaluation to provide tools to be able to ask the learning outcomes and competence of students. This strategy also fostered collaborative work between teachers through the interactive use of the platform for the interpretation and analysis of student outcomes. For the Ministry of Education, the development of citizenships and socio-emotional competence must have a right-based approach. In consequence, the materials and tools teachers receive in the plan academic work at home and in the alternation model, let's manage emotion like stress and empathy and other such competences. During this crisis, the Colombia higher education system has worked too around this type of competence, capacity, flexibility, and solidarity with the plan of higher education institution where private and public institutions share their experience and knowledge. To this, we have added a virtual education innovation lab, which promote collaboration, experimentation, research, and digital transformation. Facing the COVID-19 pandemic demand that school build up intersectorial coordination to manage associate risk and are able to continue education in emergency situation. This is need to guarantee that the school be able to strengthen the role of promoting of the construction of culture of resilience and adaptation and consolidate at the center for learning and integral development. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. We have learned that for Colombia, they have not excluded global citizenship and sustainable development. Even in this time of crisis, they have emphasized the need for teacher at home to be resilient and to close learning gaps. Thank you so much for your sharing. Now I would like to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is also very important in terms of implementing reform during this time of pandemic, Honorable Claudette Irere is the Minister of State and in charge of ICT and TVET from the Republic of Rwanda. Let's find out how Rwanda will build back better in this pandemic. So let me now call on Your Excellency Claudette Irere. Your Excellency. Okay, so we will go back to the presentation of uh, Her Excellency in terms of, you know, building back better for Rwanda. Let me now uh, have the next presenter. I hope the next presenter is here with us. So, uh, I see her. Thank you, mom. Our next presenter is influential because it heads Education International as the Deputy Secretary General, Ms. Haldis Hobbs, also used to work in Norway for Union of Education. I would like to listen more from her. Let's give our hand to our next speaker, ma'am. Thank you very much, Ethel, Your Excellencies, everyone who's listening in. It is an honor to be here today. I want to thank UNESCO for convening this meeting, which comes at a very crucial time. It comes at a crucial time for the education community around the world. And for all my fellow colleague teachers everywhere, we heard from the introductions, both from Bhutan and now the, the story from Colombia, how important it has been to support their teachers for them to be able to support their students to work on in a very difficult context. And I think that one of our major challenges when we have finished this great meeting is what do we do next? 
how do we make sure that all the good stories, all the good ideas we have of how to bring education forward, actually go home with the ministers and with the participants and reach the teachers, whether they're sitting at home or whether they're in a classroom. So they actually can get the support they need to create change. And I think that is our main challenge that we manage to have speak with teachers, not just about them and to them, because it's in a process of dialogue that we actually can create change. And it warmed my heart to listen to the minister from Colombia talking about how aware they are of that when we move forward in a very difficult context, that we keep our broad focus on what education is, what it is for our children, what we have committed to through the Sustainable Development Goals, that she mentions citizenship education, that we mention the social and well-being of our children. Because although we highlight that we are more interdependent and interconnected than ever, we are at the same time living in a situation around the world that we are more isolated than we've been in a long time. Our opportunity to meet across borders face to face in person, our opportunity to meet within countries, even within local communities is limited. And that means that we're losing those spaces where we interact and learn to relate to each other and also learn to deal with our differences and to understand that it's normal, that people have different opinions and how to deal with those differences. So we don't get into extreme situations that the only tool people know how to use is violence, as the tragic incident we saw in Paris. We know that there are times in history where both students and teachers have been attacked by individuals who have no other that's their last resort, is to go to violence. So we need to keep education as a safe place, both for students and for teachers, so that you can learn the tools of how we interact and the value of learning to listen and respect those that are different from yourselves. And I would like to highlight that although technology is a fantastic tool and it can support us in teaching and learning, and we're learning that now, we also need the offline space. You need the space where when you express yourself as a young person or an adult, it's not feed it into an algorithm. It is safe, it, you can try and fail and then learn what is the best way to move forward. That's what a classroom can do under the guidance of a qualified teacher. So yes, we need to support our teachers. We're going to need to recruit more. We're going to need to learn how to retain them also after this period where many are going into a very stressful situation and are feeling the long-term effects of it. So we need to support the well-being and make sure that we're keeping and recruiting them we have. And we need to keep their spirit and motivation up so that they are able to motivate and support their teachers. And we need to do that together. All the participants here and other partnerships that we need to get those good examples. How can we learn from each other bottom up so it's relevant in the classrooms? And you need to do that through dialogue, whether it's social dialogue, policy dialogue. You need to use the tools we have created together, like Education International did with UNESCO on the Professional Teaching Standards Framework, which gives a tool for professional standards, which you then can go home and adapt at home or the way we did together with the UN Girls Education Initiative, where we went in with support of the government of Canada in countries and tried to bottom up deal with the challenge of school related gender based violence. We need to use these good stories of speaking to each other through dialogue, learning of good examples, but not copy pasting into a context without connected, putting it into context. We learn from what worked before that can still work in the future. We need to reimagine the future, but we need not to forget what is valuable to take forward in a new future from the past we sometime, one time had 
We're going to be better at technology, but we're not going to let it replace the human contact between students and teachers who are qualified and well-trained. Thank you very much. Well said. So our teachers are very important. They are actually heroes during this time of crisis. They develop learning materials, they do videos, and they share their videos as well to other teachers. So we will take note of all your recommendations, especially on the qualification of teachers and also in terms of supporting teachers and motivating them and rewarding them perhaps. Thank you so much, Education International. Now we're going to uh, listen to our next speaker. And uh, our next speaker actually is here with us, also a policy advisor of the National Education Reform Secretariat, Republic of Ghana. He used to be a chief technical advisor for transforming teaching and learning. That's what we were talking about. And uh, he served as executive director of Associate for Development Partnerships. Now let us call on Mr. Akwasi Are Bohin to share with us his thoughts on, you know, reimagining teaching and learning. Thank you very much for this opportunity and welcome everybody. And it's interesting to catch up with you in this period when we all struggling to find out what next for us. And I'm happy that this topic talks about reimagining education. Um, I would like to just say that this pandemic really has, has given all of us, policymakers, education managers, teachers, parents, learners, all a big challenge in terms of what next to do and how we need to be addressing the, the situation of learning and ensuring that we do not lose the issue of, of making sure that learners are given the skills and competencies that they need. So we now are confronted with the question of what kind of skills do we really have to give learners and teachers at the same time? Uh, then what kind of, how do ministries of education integrate the issues of um, health, public health, uh, social welfare because of the psychosocial needs that is arising? How do we integrate all that into the, our education systems? How do we also develop new tools to assess the way in which children learn? And how do we ensure that schools adopt to the approaches of learning recovery when schools finally reopen and, and kids are back to school? Um, the other thing that we also need to be thinking about is how can schools, how can ministries build a resilient and alternative education delivery systems uh, in, 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 in countries so that we can you know, withstand future epidemics, future emergencies and other things. And then the next is how we take ministries of education and governments to invest in appropriate technologies and infrastructure for accelerated blended learning. Now that we know that technology is going to be a key part of what we do and how education is delivered, how do we integrate technology and need appropriate technology? How do governments engage parents, stakeholders of education? Because in the past, we know that children come to school to learn, but today we are learning, we are, we are getting to understand that education is not only at the school level, it can only also be in the home. And so how do we engage parents and make them understand what we are supposed to be doing? And then how do we address the key critical equity gender equality issues and the, the issues of economic disparity, uh, the issues of poverty, digital uh, poverty, and all those kinds of um, issues that have been exposed, we've been exposed to during this period of pandemic so that we can get every child learning and every, every teacher also teaching. So we think that governments and ministries of education should strategically consider the deployment of context appropriate teaching and learning technologies. In the past, we have allowed technology to rather come into education and determine how technology needs to be used in education. But I think we are at a point where education should begin to detect what kind of technology works for it. And, and we need to balance this, this understanding of how the importance of technology 
to education. And then ministry should also deploy online resources, uh, e-learning technologies, and also ensure that these are actually incorporated and integrated into emerging pedagogies that teachers are comfortable uh, with and, and use in the classroom, making sure that we are building on the self-directed learning that we are now getting to understand that COVID has shown us and that a lot of the learning is actually, needs to actually be self-directed. And then ministries of education should also provide continuous professional development for teachers uh, to be digitally relevant in the new and the new normal that we have in terms of the, the, the blended approach learning and the blended approach to teaching. How do we ensure that on a day-to-day -day basis and on a continued basis, we provide teachers with the dinner training that they have? Uh, and then Ministry of Education should also adopt a robust monitoring and assessment of teaching and learning to generate the right data and information for school leaders and policymakers. At the moment, in most countries, uh, data is not, is, not, is not central to a lot of the decisions that are taken. But in this period, in this reimagined education uh, ecosystem, we need data to drive decisions, to understand Mr. what- Bohim, we'd like yeah. you to wrap up because we, uh, we're running out of time. Could you wrap up your uh, point? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So at the end of the day, we, 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 we know that education is going to change forever and therefore we should be prepared for it and we should be uh, ready to adopt what would work and what would make learning uh, continue. Thank you. Very well said, Your Excellency. Now we'd like to listen to our next uh, powerful speaker who also served as Minister of, Minister of Education in Peru from 2013 to 2016. And he led many reforms in also the Inter-American Development Bank, to name a few. And he, he is now the Global Director of Education for the World Bank. Dr. Jaime Saavedra Shanduvi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much for uh for this invitation and for having me. Uh, it is um, uh, really um, a fantastic opportunity uh, for us to share some thoughts. And it's great that the uh, that UNESCO is convening uh, this uh, global education meeting at these extraordinary times. Um, so uh, as, as, as my uh, predecessors have said, I mean, we're, we're living the most um, um, difficult crisis of education of the last 100 years. We have never lived, lived these twin shocks of both our, uh, extended um, school closures and deep economic recessions. Um, but there are some lessons that we can derive from this, uh, from this pandemic, um, from the experience that we are all living um, both in terms of trying to cope with this crisis through multi-platform remote learning, as you were as you were uh, mentioning, and also seeing what's this different role of teachers, of parents, of media, right, in the education process, um, uh, in the in the teaching learning process of our students. So I want to focus on two lessons, right, that um, uh, that that pandemic is leaving us. One is that we need um, uh, we need to close the digital divide, right? We we have seen that from a technology perspective and from a connectivity perspective, the world was just not prepared, uh, and we have been talking about the digital divide for the last um, for the last twenty years, and uh, we have said that that has to be closed. And unfortunately, that didn't that didn't happen. If we would have made more progress, right, in making sure that the whole ecosystem would would have been there of hardware, software, teachers, professional development uh, support, the, uh, the whole administrative and logistical apparatus that is needed in order to maintain a technological ecosystems, we'd have been better prefer, pre prepared. We, things would have been better, not great, but better. So that is definitely a homework for, for all of us. But a second lesson, and as, at least as important as that, is that education is a social phenomenon that education is about interactions. Um, and there we could say two things. Well, that school itself is a social space where children have to learn not only academics, but have to learn all the skills for life. 
uh, that's where they will have to learn the uh, what, what the Minister of Colombia was saying, solidarity, teamwork, empathy. But at the same time, when we talk about the school as a, as a, as a social space, and we recognize that education is about human interactions, we, we are now recognizing, I mean, in this, as, as part of the school closures, we're seeing how important and how critical is the interaction of students with the teachers and with, and with their peers. So I, and I see there that it's a critical uh, additional lesson is that understanding by societies of the fundamental role that teachers play, right, in the whole education process. Right, um, we are saying technology is absolutely critical, but teachers would never be replaced by robots. Right, teachers have to be their wor work of teachers have to be augmented, have to be en en enhanced by technology, and technology can be a fantastic tool. But teachers are there to coach, to facilitate, to inspire learning, right, to help in the whole learning process to teachers. And we all know um, that uh, being, uh, being adults, we all remember by by name that teacher that inspired us, that teacher that said something that changed our lives. So in this uh, learning process of the future, which is being propelled to today, a key lesson is that we need to precisely find that right balance between technology and the human factor. Um, I, I think it is a great opportunity and hopefully, um, uh, societies will take this opportunity of recognizing that what characterizes right, a successful education system is giving the right social value to the teaching profession. Right? If, we, if we see what's the right, what's one predictor right, that characterizes education systems right, that are successful in giving quality education, equitable education to other children, is precisely education systems in which the teaching career is socially valued. And now it's this, that's even more critical today because as government moves towards implementation of distance learning, blended learning, hybrid learning, and as schools re are, are reopened and we move towards the learning of the future, what we are asking teachers is each time more difficult, right? Because true, I mean, information is out, is out there. So teachers are not a source of, inf of information. Teachers are a source of inspiration, right? Are what will lead our students to be creative thinkers, are to be, to be in, uh, independent thinkers, to be people who can disentangle the tr truth, uh, truth um, from false facts. And Dr. that Heimler, role- uh, Sorry yes, to that, ask you, uh, uh, your time is almost up. Can you wrap up a bit, please? Thank you. Yes. Yes, and precisely, right, in order, in order to make sure that we recognize, right, that uh, extremely difficult task um, of, of teachers is that we need, we need to make sure that we continue a process of investing heavily in teachers' professional development precisely, right, to make sure that they, all teachers, have the tools to be able to fulfill that extremely complex role that societies are giving them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Well said. So teachers are there to inspire and also uh, about connectivity, digital divide. We learned a lot from uh, your recommendations. And uh, that brings us to the teacher task force. So the teacher task force is actually a group which includes national government, intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organization and development agencies, and they work really to support the SDGs and more. So more will be shared later. And I would like now to call on our uh, speaker who uh, I called earlier, and I think uh, the minister is now here, Honorable Claudette Irere, is representing the Republic of Rwanda, and she was Minister of State in charge of ICT and TVET. Minister? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, my apologies once again for not making it earlier. Um, I had an unexpected urgent meeting and I had to, to, uh, to go. Um, now uh, on to my... Um... Uh, speaking on uh, notes as well. Um, Excellencies, all protocols are observed, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure and honor to join this global education meeting on behalf of um, the Ministry of Education of the Government of Rwanda and to speak on this particular theme of 
um, reimagining and learning at the time education sector is globally challenged and many countries are designing and tackling at the same time recovery mechanisms. I'm glad to note that this meeting has brought us from all education um, uh, walks of life and the importance of such uh, uh, this particular conversation um, when uh, at this particular time when Rwanda, like many other countries, uh, is reopening schools um, starting from this week, it is appreciated uh, tremendously. As I try to reflect on what we think is necessary to change in teaching and learning in order to improve uh, learners' abilities to respond to the current and uh, other global challenges to meet various international objectives uh, for teaching and learning, I'll try as much as possible to highlight Rwanda's experience throughout um, this period. Um, when schools were closed in mid-March mid this year in Rwanda, no one anticipated that it would take us close to seven months to consider reopening them again. Um, nevertheless, we started thinking of different ways we can use this time to improve uh, many other challenges we already had and that were impacting the quality of education as uh, infrastructure development. I'll come back to this uh, later. By addressing uh, this um, challenge, we're going to ensure that once schools are reopened, we didn't know when, teacher people ratio would have decreased from an average of um, one to 65 to at least one to 50 approximately, uh, at least in the, in the lower levels um, of education. Today, countrywide, we're building more than 20,000 uh, classrooms uh, recruiting the matching number of teachers, training the existing teacher workforce in ICT and English, uh, as it's a medium and uh, improving uh, their paid skills. We as MSF and others started implementing remote um, and online teaching and learning to ensure there was some level of continuity even though we were very much aware that not everyone had equal access to this. Telecommunication companies uh, were at the forefront. They zero-rated teaching platforms, and this ensured that at least anyone with a connected device would have access uh, at zero cost. Radios and TVs helped in broadcasting lessons, and this helped in ensuring that even students in remote um, areas we still have access. Some partners even started distributing radios to the most vulnerable families across the country, the same way I'm sure um, social protection programs would work. They say that desperate situations call for desperate measures. None of the above would have been achieved if collective efforts from policymakers, private sector, including young startups, development partners, CSOs, teachers, and this is very important, and schools, students, and their parents had, in, had not embraced the disruptive nature of these challenging times we're, we're, we're in. Everyone recognized the need for change, and we all acted accordingly. This is not to say that it happened without challenges. We're far from that. To achieve relevant, high-quality, demand-driven teaching um, and learning virtually requires more than what I just described. As the education sector, we need to collectively commit to improving, uh, one, the welfare of teachers. I think uh, the previous um, speaker articulated it well. Nothing is going to, to replace the teacher. The development of any educational system depends on the teacher and the quality of teaching. Teachers play crucial and important role in building the education sector. And strategies aimed at promoting the, the quality of teaching should consider uh, really um, supporting them at the core. Thank the you very much, Minister Irere. Your time is up. We have learned so much from you, especially on your ideas about teacher and also on setting up strategic partnerships so that we can deliver. Thank you so much. And now I would like to call on our next presenter, who is actually uh, also uh, among Canada's 
10 Best Educators by Time Magazine. Professor Dr. Karen Mundy is from the University of Toronto, Canada. And before joining uh, or returning to uh, University of Toronto, she was with the Global Partnership in Education and she served as Chief Technical Officer there. So uh, let us listen to Dr. Karen. Uh, Dr. Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, esteemed colleagues, honorable ministers. It's really a pleasure to speak to you. And I thought perhaps today my best role might be just to speak a little bit about the growing amount of research that we now have about responses to the pandemic and what we can then learn about that, particularly about the role of teachers. So I'm gonna make three short points. I hope I'll stick to my time. First of all, we can see from surveys conducted by UNESCO, by Education International, the OECD, and many non-governmental organizations, that governments themselves were uh, unprepared uh, for a crisis of this kind. But in particular, most governments turned their attention first to the development of online learning materials, to getting remote learning up and running, and not to reaching out to teachers directly. Most, not all, but most. And that is true even in very uh, uh, rich countries like my own, like Canada. As a result, teachers did not receive uh, instruction about social and emotional responses to the pandemic. Uh, often in research that we recently conducted for, for UNESCO, we found that teachers described themselves as left hanging in the wind. So this failure to activate the teaching force during a pandemic, I think is something we can all learn from. Um, one of the interesting features we found in, in research recently in six countries is that almost no one understood or, or even uh, had ever heard the term teacher leadership. And I think this is an area that we need to think about further and reflect upon. Second, despite um, many of the, the, in many countries, this lack of support to teachers, especially in the first wave of the pandemic, in almost every country, in almost every survey, we can find very um, exciting and um, inspiring examples of teacher leadership, of teacher innovation, from the teacher that went into the city square or the town square with a megaphone to the ones that held small, uh, small sort of informal uh, tutoring sessions with kids to those who got all the parents of kids on WhatsApp. Around the world, you find teachers innovating. And then the third point I want to make is that teachers themselves are are, are increasingly vocal about what they need to succeed, not just during an emergency, but also uh, what they've learned from the emergency that could help them to be more effective going forward. So the first point I'd like to make here is that teachers are not uh, opposed to digital and online learning. In fact, uh, across the surveys, teachers show a very great interest in becoming digital natives, in having access to technology, connectivity, and using that particularly, not just to enhance their relationship and their teaching of students, but also for, they, for themselves, for their own professional development. One, two, teachers in, in almost uh, every country where uh, you saw these sort of small scale innovations among teachers, you also see teachers developing collaborative networks and leveraging technology to develop uh, learning across small networks of teachers. And in this way, they were able to see reform. So this emphasis on collaboration and on using technology for teacher collaboration, I think is a, a very um, important. Uh, just to sum up, I'll be keeping it very short. First of all, national responses were not adequate to activate the, the teaching working force to teachers on the front line in the face of a pandemic. And certainly we should learn a lesson about our ability as policymakers, as policy leaders to activate teachers, uh, including in the area of social and emotional support for uh, children. And then second, we know that teachers themselves actively need to um, develop their digital skills and they want to use digital platforms for their own professional uh, development. I think this is an area of enormous importance going forward. Finally, uh, supporting teachers own networks for exchange and learning appears to be very important. And then I would just say providing support to teachers allows them to pivot. And if that support 
if that ability to activate the teaching force to support their, their active role during pandemic, during crises, uh, and even in their day-to-day -day work isn't there, uh, then we all lose in the future of education. Thanks. Thank you so much. And also for keeping the time, we learn a lot from your recommendations and uh, they will surely be recorded as we prepare for our response to the uh, GEM or Global Education Meeting. And I would like now to call on the youth representative actually. Uh, she's already with us. Miss Yara Ramadan is from Palestine. Given the rapid change in the society and most COVID pandemic, what do you think young people would expect from education and teaching and learning? So we'd like to hear from our youth representative, Ms. Yara. Um, hi, everyone, honorable panelists and uh, UN officials. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the chance to be part of this. Um, today, I will not be talking or addressing the expectations of youth from uh, their education when it comes to providing technical devices and stable internet connection to all students, um, nor will I be talking about the expectations to uh, reach the unreached ones, especially in mar marginalized situations. But it is very, very important for me uh, to launch my talk by echoing what Ms. Halls uh, has said uh, and highlighting the need for psychological support at, the, at this point uh, from the educational uh, system itself. Um, because studies uh, say that the mental health of young adults uh, is on stake. So let's not forget um, uh, among all this pressure to integrate mental support within the educational system. Now let's go to the uh, real question. What do youth, um, a, a young people expect from their education? Uh, when it comes to the uh, content, uh, the students wish to obtain knowledge, not only related to the curricula, but also information about dealing with multiple global crises that are barely mentioned in any school curriculum. Uh, this allows them to be more involved, aware, and um, uh, qualified to understand, uh, explain, and deal with such crisis. We all have uh, seen students freaking out and flauntering when the COVID-19 pandemic first hit because they were simply not ready to face such uh, situations. So we, young people, we all wish uh, to be well informed if anything like this uh, ever happens again, uh, to be prepared um, and uh, to be on point. We appreciate our uh, source of knowledge, the educators, uh, to enrich the educational process with applicable, uh, with, um, applicable, applicable uh, uh, curricula, um, life skills and knowledge instead of only uh, spoon feeding students with information that will never be uh, used. Now, all this can never uh, happen without an updated approach to education. To um, address that, I'd like, first of all, to differentiate between, between two age groups of students, the four to 13 year olds and uh, 14 above year olds. Um, let's start with the four to 13 uh, year olds who are used to, to um, easily consume technology. They grew up with uh, smart devices, phones and tablets, at their disposal, which led to high expectations on their uh, end from educators in order to uh, stay engaged in an online class setting. Hence, uh, the young uh, ones expect their teachers to completely abandon the duplication of the teacher's uh, teacher-centered classroom and use different approaches by utilizing all the tools that technology provides. Studies have shown that uh, children extensively use their uh, senses to learn which makes learning fun um, and effective through the use of technology. Now, according to uh, BYJU, uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Uh, Mohit, he says, and I quote, over a period, we have observed that clever integration of games and demonstrated high engagement and uh, increasing motiva motivation towards learning, especially among young students, making them truly fall in love with learning. So the expectation is to uh, receive entertaining and engaging educational material that is simple to digest for uh, the young ones. Now, when it comes to the 14 and above year old uh, students, uh, they also expect their educators to go uh, beyond replicating the physical class uh, lecture through video. And instead using a range of uh, collaboration uh, tools and engagement methods that promote inclusion, 
uh, personalization and um, uh, intelligence within the classroom itself, of course. Um, any educational setting uh, shall include uh, the four C's, as we know, uh, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, and creativity. Uh, uh, who um, Now, how do we see that in uh, online lecturing? Like basic online lect lecturing, we don't see that. So in order to achieve that, uh, students wish for group work and have interactive activities within the lecture itself and not after it in order to avoid the extra pressure of uh, distance learning. Now everyone knows that uh, we are all in, on edge when it comes to stress, so let's not add up to it. We also expect educators to uh, catch up on the literacy of the online tools because that's one of the reasons lectures are very exhausting these days. Educate, uh, educators in uh, so many classes um, do not have the technological uh, literacy that the students have. So they end up making the students stare at screens for so long that they uh, lose track. So finding a routine in using these tools is what, ma is what makes education um, much accessible for students. And let Thank us not very forget. much, Miss Yara. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Yes, uh, your time is up, but we really value your comments and your recommendations. Yeah, we need to reach sure. the marginalized, the youth, and provide psychological support and, uh, you know, how to effectively use technology, the support to the youth and the engagement of the youth in this pandemic. Thank you so much. We may be able to call uh, all of you again, but uh, I, I would like to, you know, move on to the next phase, which is actually Q&A. But before I, I do that, I would like to give uh, uh, Minister Irere uh, a wrapping up of probably one to two minutes. We still have a little time left. Minister, Ooh, thank, you. thank you so much. Okay, so we still, we save a little time. Could you uh, finish your wrap up session? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as I was uh, saying, I was uh, just touching on the welfare of teachers and, uh, you know, talking about how it's important uh, to support them um, throughout this time. But uh, my second point was going to be integration of ICT in learning and, and teaching, um, not just, you know, from the point of view of tools and uh, devices, but making sure that teachers are prepared accordingly to meet a multiplicity of challenges, and then they can apply this modern technology to, ma to maintain the dynamism. Um, the, another point that I was going to make was uh, on continuous uh, professional development. Again, it comes back to teachers. Um, teaching is a dynamic profession and it calls for uh, progressive training to be able to meet learners' needs. So schools, this was a lesson for Rwanda, but it is also, I think, a lesson that we all need to commit to as the education sector. It increases the teachers' motivation, confidence, but it also keeps them up to date. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention was on the competence-based um, um, curriculum that uh, Rwanda has adopted, but I'm sure that many other countries uh, are looking at uh, adopting or have already adopted. Um, this enables learners to understand the complex realities and processes of uh, today's world and develop values, attitudes, knowledge, and skills that will enable them to face the challenges of an interconnected world. So competency-based curriculum is at the core and it makes uh, learners learn better and understand better um, how uh, they can um, navigate this, this world. Um, another, maybe my last point is going to be, because I represent, yes, um, the ICT uh, component, uh, but I also represent the TVET sector. I think going forward, it is very important that uh, uh, the TVET component of education is not left out. Particularly, and I'm sure this was the case in Rwanda, but I know that even for others, um, you cannot put TVET online and expect that people will learn. TVET requires practical um, teaching, hands-on skills. Um, as we navigate this new world, it is very important that um, the trainees and trainers are given adequate um, facilitation for them to really be able to navigate both worlds. 
they will need the practical skills, but they will also need the simulations and other technology uh, that will be uh, able to support them. Coaching and mentorship. This goes without saying, and it is, it is both applicable, both to the teachers and to the learners as well. These uh, strategies are increasingly being recognized as key components to improving um, teacher quality, especially at the time when COVID touched all of us uh, financially, economically, we all need this sort of um, um, you know, program to ensure that our teachers are motivated. And we also understand and put ourselves um, in their shoes for them to be able um, to, to, to navigate uh, this world. Uh, the 21st century requires key competences as far as education is concerned. There's critical thinking, complex problem solving, uh, global citizenship. And without rethinking and reimagining the education sector, we'll not be able to achieve this. As I conclude, um, I think I just wanted to call on the combined efforts and strategies to improve learners' abilities as we prepare to be able to respond to the current and future global challenges. This was the first, there will be many others. And uh, it calls on improvement of mainly teachers' quality of uh, teaching and learning and their, um, and their welfare as well. Um, I thank you once again for giving me the opportunity uh, to conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Irere. It's very wonderful for you to mention about the need for technical vocational education to reimagine how we can teach that during this time when everything has to be, you know, online, virtual, or blended is quite difficult. And uh, thank you for your recommendations on the welfare of teachers, as well as the integration of ICT. Now I would like to uh, open for a question and answer and or any reaction. So uh, may we now call for Norway. I'm, I'm finding out, okay. So uh, if you don't have yet questions from Norway, I would like to request panelists to give a short response to the question provided by our participants, especially on how to address adult education and adult literacy and those who are in non, uh, in non formal mode. Is there any recommendation? And who would like to answer first? What would be the best response for non formal education and adult learning literacy? Anyone? from the panel. Yes, I would like to share some of the experience that we have um, uh, introduced in Ghana, where we're dealing with the uh, art of school children and using the spaces because these schools are mostly organized at the community level. And therefore the teachers who come in as facilitators continue to work with them, of course, observing all the uh, protocols required by COVID. And as a result, we have continued to provide learning for these uh, kinds of students. And so in, in multiplying that into the entire school system, it looks as if we would be able to um, support kids learning even in the time when schools are closed and, and, and at least be able to provide some one hour um, opportunity for teachers and facilitators to interact at that level, uh, observing all this uh, social distancing and uh, other protocols that are related to COVID. And that is a very good example that we have in Ghana. Thank you so much for sharing that example. Any other response from uh all our speakers. May I? Thank you, Education International. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. And I, I want to answer, respond a little more generally because I think the, the combination of the, the last comments from Rwanda and the questions uh, is very important. And that is understanding that education is not just one sector. 
that uh, we have to address the challenges from early childhood to adult education with uh, slightly different responses. And uh, we had the example of TWET that how can you do vocational training online? Some can be done through creativity, but different solutions from how you address the problem for in primary school. The youngest children, the toddlers, would need a very different approach. We heard from our youth representative from Yara about the mental and stress that young people are feeling. The students in higher education, how they, some of them isolated in small dwellings and far from their family. And also the challenges for the teachers in the different sectors are different. And that will also apply to adult education and informal and non-formal education. So my uh, challenge is to policymakers to make sure that you diversify your tools and your policies so they're fit for purpose in the different sectors. And again, then go and dialogue with the people who work in, with it. Dialogue with the teachers, ask them what you need. Thank you very much, Education International. Now I would like to call on those who raised their hands for question. And I would like to start with Norway and then Miss Joanna. Norway, please. Can you unmute yourself, Norway, and uh, share with us your question? Okay, uh, Dr. Stig, are you there? Can you raise your question now? All right, uh, something is wrong with that. So I would like to listen to the next question to be shown to us by Ms. Joanna Paolo Harvey. Ms. Joanna, the first yes. one. Thank you. Yes, I hope. I hope you can hear us. We had some technical challenges. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for very, very interesting introductions. I think they reflect very well the situation which we all are experiencing in the member states. So I'm, I'm uh, uh, representing Finnish Ministry of Education, Finland. And we have been speaking quite a lot about flexibility and importance of flexibility in mastering these uh, challenges which COVID is putting ahead of us. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, idea of, uh, of flexibility was referred by so many speakers also today. So uh, I would like to pose a question to the panelists, uh, whoever wishes to take it. How do you feel, uh, how important is the long-term flexibility in the system? I mean, uh, what we need is that the system should react very quickly. And as I said so many times today, also the teachers need flexibility in their work. They need support, they need creativity, they need innovation, but they have to be able to be equipped with the skills that they can act and change their methods, uh, their means very quickly. So how this flexibility could be inbuilt in the system, uh, in a teacher's role, how you can de develop teacher's role, and how it could be inbuilt for longer term in education systems in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to call response from our presenters. If you would like to share the response now. So if I may, um, this is Jaime Saavedra. Yes, Dr. Jaime, please. So uh, just I want to one, want to make one reflection regarding the last point. I think um, one thing that we have learned uh, also of this pandemic is the uh, the need to um, learn continuously about how to adapt the education system at the macro level and how to adapt at the at the school level, uh, and that's something that um, um, this this juncture has shown us that some things that uh, would have been unthinkable before suddenly, I mean, had to be adopted as, as innovations uh, by schools and by teachers, right? So just to give an example, I mean, we have been seeing a massive use of social media, a massive use of WhatsApp of teachers in order to communicate 
very creatively with other teachers and with their students, right? If we would have been in normal times, probably would have run a long pilot project will have tried to evaluate it and see if that would make sense to have it as part of the practices of teachers. Well, actually that happened in weeks, right? And um, it was just part of the, uh, I mean, the toolkit that teachers and, and principals just said, okay, we need to use that. We need to use whatever is in our hands in order to try to maintain the engagement of, of, of students. So one thing, one thing that we'll need to learn is that we'll need to be able to allow the system to try things maybe find that some things, some things might not work and then do them in a, in a, in a, in a different way. The online engagement is going to, I mean, show some, uh, some uh, potential promising uh, ways of, of delivering education. Other things will fail, but we need to learn the, that um, trying and learning and evaluating permanently has to be a feature of our education systems at all levels, right? At the level of what we allow teachers to do and at the level of the system of the system as a whole. So I think that flexibility, that capacity to learn of education systems is something that we need to take uh, as one lesson of this pandemic. I wouldn't mind jumping in just quickly to build on what Jaime has said. I think this idea of flexibility is a very important one, but I think about it in relation to, for example, architectural um, uh, design. So there, what you're looking for, for example, in a earthquake zone is a building that is resilient and flexible. In other words, the infrastructure itself can bend to the force of, for example, an earthquake. Um, in education, we need to think about our systems in exactly that way. So what is that infrastructure? What's the foundational architecture that has to be in place to allow for resilience? And I think uh, one uh, piece that Jaime's already mentioned is connectivity. Well, I think you are in a world where we have to start imagining that every teacher needs that connectivity. That is the basic relay for all education. And what we found when we look across all of the surveys is that a remarkable number of teachers don't have a digital access, a routine digital access. They don't have a smartphone, uh, not to mention an iPad or a computer or uh, connectivity. So I think we have to really start to be very practical about this. What's this infrastructure look like and how to use it? Teachers are on that relay, the most important node. Nothing can be delivered without them. But at the same time, they're not connected. We've got a problem. It's not only getting students connected. That's of course important, but perhaps financially impossible. But if teachers aren't connected, they can't improve. They can't learn. They can't access information. They can't be supported. So I think that's the point I would like to make about well, flexibility. Can I quickly make a point here? Yeah. Um, just to say that traditionally we've known that education has been very conservative and it's been difficult to really transform and to, to build on experiences. And so, but fortunately, this pandemic is really teaching us how we need to begin to adapt very quickly to things. And, and all the challenges that we have been exposed to through this pandemic, obviously is telling us that as policymakers, as managers of education, as teachers, as parents, and everybody working together, we need to look at the possibilities of us being flexible in the way in which we approach things and the way in which we build our education systems such that we, we have a resilient system that can respond to any future emergency or any future pandemic like this so that we don't lose eight months of, of education. This probably should never happen again. Thank you so much. There is a question about early childhood and also that young children should not be exposed to screens. So are there any good examples from your countries in terms of, you know, early childhood care education and development during the time of pandemic? From our presenters, what's your intervention for ECCD? Well, for our region, Southeast Asia, I have seen uh, some learning materials developed by teachers, singing, dancing, of course, using the video recording, and also some of them, they have to go to the 
children and support them as well. Some are uh, have to be face to face uh, once or twice a week. But if you have any intervention on early childhood that you would like to share from the speakers? Just to say that um, in some work that I've completed for the Yadan Foundation, we learned quite a bit about what uh, experts in the field of early childhood education are doing during the pandemic to make sure that some of the initiatives that really have strong impacts on uh, children's early learning, so for example, early reading programs and so on, have, got, have been taken online. And they have some great lessons for us all related to how to use technology for interaction with small groups of kids, how to provide online sort of tutoring and reading in, in areas like early reading, early literate numeracy. So um, it's quite fascinating. The neuroscientists will tell you that uh, if they give the same materials in a canned sort of format to young children, the children do not respond. Their, their brains do not work. They do not you know, fire up in the same way as if it's human interaction. But if if the in technology is used for actually very strong interactive engagement with kids in smaller groups, then the brains the brain does fire up. So I think this is we're learning a lot from neuroscience about early childhood development and about the limits and possibilities of digital interface. It is possible, but it has to be structured very differently and very carefully. Thank you very much, Dr. Karen. I'm sure there will be more. Uh good practices that we can learn from each other. And maybe the teacher task force can do more research on consolidating all of these good practices in reimagining teaching and learning. So I don't think we have a lot of time and we have answered questions from early childhood to TVET, higher education, youth, adult learning and non-formal education. So if there is uh, one uh, more message from you that you would like to share, to the audience and to this group, uh, what would that be? One message on reimagining teaching and learning. You can say one word or one sentence. Minister Jai B. Rai, is there any recommendation if we ask you what would be the priority? One word or one sentence. I, I don't think uh, I can talk in one word. There, <laughs> Always there are a lot okay. of words. Yes, give us your message. Thank you so much. Uh, so far, I think uh, uh, I think everybody is trying globally. Uh, all our educators, education scientists, and also all, everybody leaders are trying to uh, get back, re-stabilize ourselves to what we are, what where we have uh, fallen before. So. Here, what I would like to share today is that one thing is very, very clear that uh, it's okay. Pandemic has uh, uh, has a plus point as well as a uh, minus point. What I see is definitely COVID-19 has taught us, taught us the way forward now. Our life, humanity, and hereafter, uh, uh, it has greatly taught us a great lesson. That That's why now, if uh, one thing that uh, Ethel, that I would like to say here is, now it goes without saying, let all other uh, things fall, but then education system must be made resilient enough, come what may in the world, but then education system must, must be made strong and resilient enough to uh, counter or adapt to any kind of situation hereafter. That, uh, that what I feel, uh, and even in Bhutan, what we are looking at is now it goes without saying that we must uh, adopt to blended learning, that uh, blended learning using now, uh, yes, um, uh, in a certain uh, uh, ratio, maybe 60, 40, we can't replace the contact teaching with the virtual teaching learning, but then definitely we would like to, we have to upgrade ourselves from simply teaching, uh, contact teaching learning to uh, virtual uh, teaching learning. So in that way, we need to upgrade it. That's why now we all are working towards it and hope uh, uh, we will have an opportunity to, to, to share later part of the days. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Minister Jaibi Rai. That's enough to give us the whole context of this thematic discussion on reimagine teaching and learning. Very good summary. Our rapporteur, uh, Dr. Director Yumiko, will give the presentation in the plenary. And uh, as of now, I would like to thank all our panelists for sharing all your expertise, your recommendations on this particular theme and the teacher task force. More work to be done, but I'm very, very glad that we're all doing this together and together we will make it happen. Thank you so much to our experts and panelists and we're ready now to move to the main session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, okay, wonderful time, okay. Mute mode. Mute now.